Welcome uh, to this forum for candidates for Ward 6 of the Corvallis City Council race. This online program is co-hosted this evening by the Lynn Benton branch of the NAACP and the League of Women Voters of Corvallis. My name is Greg Corper and I reside in Corvallis. I serve as the chair of the Political Action Committee of the Lynn Benton branch of the NAACP. Our organization has been active in this community since 1971. Our members are of diverse racial and ethnic backgrounds working as advocates united in the fight to end racial inequality for all Americans. A nonpartisan organization, we are proud to co-sponsor this event to better inform Corvallis voters of key issues in the 2024 Corvallis City Council election. We convey our thanks to the candidates who are participating in the forum this evening and to all candidates on the 2024 ballot who serve the values and ideals of American democracy. I'm joined this evening by Ann Smart as our co-moderator for the session. Ann, can, uh, would you please share a few words uh, with us? The League of Women Voters, um... Of Corvallis is a nonpartisan advocacy and education organization working to defend our democracy and engage our community on the issues that matter most to them. I encourage those listening to this forum to seek out additional information and get involved with the League and the NAACP in our community. And I'm a member of the Voter Service com uh, Committee, and we're the ones that um, pull together these forums. Thanks very much, Anne. I'm going to stop sharing of my screen now, and we can get started. So um, welcome to Allison Bowden, Brendan Kohlberg, and Richard Masella. And uh, thank you for being here for the Candidate Forum. To open the discussion, we're going to ask that each of you take uh, at most two minutes to introduce yourself to the voters who are watching this recording and to share why you are running for city council. We're going to start with Allison, then we'll move to Brennan and uh, Richard, you will be uh, third in the order for these introductions. So Allison, uh, please, the floor is yours. Thank you, Greg and Anne. Uh, good evening, everyone. My name is Allison Bowden. My pronouns are they, them, and I'm excited to be here tonight as a candidate for Ward 6. I first came to Corvallis for education, but I ended up staying for community. Over the past eight years, I've had the privilege of working in various roles that allowed me to actively contribute to the city I've grown to love. From my involvement with Corvallis Parks and Recreation to my work advocating for labor and tenants' rights, I've always been passionate about making our community stronger. My political drive has been nurtured through organizing with Tenants United Corvallis, where I found the opportunity to run for city council alongside other passionate, engaged community members. As a union representative for the classified staff in our school district, I have proven experience advocating for workers' rights, crafting policy, and balancing the needs of our staff with the fiscal responsibility of a public institution. My goal is to bring this balanced, collaborative approach to the City Council to create policies that improve the lives of all residents while ensuring long-term sustainability. Thank you, Allison. Brennan, you're next. Thank you. Uh, I'm a software engineer and a systems design expert. I've been living here for about five years. Um, a few or a, a few of the different things I've done. Uh, I have a, in my garage. I have a molecule manufacturing company where I make these three D printed molecules. This is a, a perfluorooctane sulfonic acid, which is a PFA. It's a you know bad chemical that's in some drinking water. Um, about two years ago, I or year and a half ago, I started attending city council meetings and talking about some of the problems that I saw with our land use code. Um, I caught the eye of some city councilors and Lori Chaplin, the current incumbent in our ward approached me this spring to ask me to run for her seat because she can't for family reasons. 
Um, I understand that our city has two really big intertwined economic issues that are really trump all else. Um, one is that our, our housing prices are crazy. You know, house prices, especially for starter homes, have gone up 50% or more in the last four years. Same with rent. It's, it's, we're the mo most rent burdened city in the state, and it's only getting worse. Also, we don't have many high paying jobs here. You know, we have the university, we have the hospital, we have HP, HP is shrinking. And, and, and it can be that some people come here and it's brutal. You know, they, they lose a job at HP, they lose a job at the university and they have to go somewhere else. And so this makes the community kind of transitory. And it also makes it so that people can't put down roots even when they want to here. Um, economic issues here are really hard. They cost a lot of money to fix and that's more money than the city has. And so the only way we can really fix them is with a systems effort. Um, you ha we have to incentivize and enable private capital to come in and you know, build more industry to make more jobs, to build more housing, to you know, raise quality and lower rent prices and allow tenants to have more leverage against their landlords. Um, both of these things are attributes of a codified system. We use legal code here in my job, I use software code, but fundamentally they're very similar. It's a system that's operating and, and can use little fixes. This is what I've done in my professional life. This is what I would, will try to do on council, focusing on these main two things. Thank you, Brendan. And Richard. Hello, uh, I'm Richard Masella. I am currently a stay-at-home dad. Uh, my background uh, professionally is in brewing. I spent more than a decade doing that uh, in Oregon, Vermont. Uh, and uh, my wife and I moved to Corvallis in 2016, and we were lucky enough to buy our house when it was so affordable. Um, I think, like Brennan and Allison, I think a big concern is the affordability of our community. This is obviously a place where lots of people want to live. It's a very, it's a beautiful community, and I love living here, and I want to make sure that it continues to be accessible to people in uh, my age range, my background, who are not people who are making six, seven figures a year, and that we can continue to be resilient and, uh, you know, uh, continue to attract people that uh, want to live here and improve our community. Well, thank you, Richard. Thanks very much. Uh, and thank all of you for those introductions. Uh, we will now uh, present a list of seven questions for our three candidates to respond to. These questions were supplied to the candidates before tonight's forum. Uh, for our first question, we're going to go in the order of uh, first Brennan, then Richard, then Allison. We will rotate the order with each subsequent question. And candidate responses are, again, limited to two minutes per question. So let me start with the, with the first question we'd like to ask tonight. The candidates, what do you see as the biggest issues facing the city in the next five years? How do you propose to tackle those issues? Brennan, we start with you. Sounds good. Sort of as in my introduction, I think we basically have two issues that dwarf everything else. Uh, one is that we have some of the highest um, rents and housing prices in the area. The second is that we don't have many good jobs, especially for those who aren't extremely well-educated around here. Um, the two of these combine to make our city the worst rent burdened uh, you know, population in the state of Oregon, defined as like people who pay more than 30% of their income for their housing. Um, these problems are fundamentally big systems problems. It takes you know, hundreds of millions of dollars of capital to build you know, uh, industry for jobs, to build housing in order to do this. This is something the city can't do. And so what we need to do is enable others, enable those like private capital to sort of come in and help do this for us. Um, I've been talking with some city bureaucrats over the last few months, really trying to get my head around the system. Um, one of the main things I understand us as needing to be able to do is to build more industry. Um, this can be done, main limiter, as I understand it, is sort of shovel ready land for people to come in and you know build small factories, stuff, stuff that's nothing or nothing really big or impactful, but something things that um, are worth quite a bit of money so that they build us more property tax. And then they also give more, uh, you know, high paying jobs to even non-well-educated members of our community. Um, 
mainly what this means is you need more certainty in the permitting process. You need more, you need people who are coming in to say like, oh, look, pretty confidently in two or three years, I'm going to be able to open this if I'm wanting to put in a quarter billion dollars. Uh, and then that, that'll also juice our city budget. We get property tax when, when people invest in industry in our community. And the city is really running into a shortage of revenue in order to fund its basic services. We're having to hike our fees. We're having to hike our city services bills. You know, uh, we're having to look at all kinds of different fees that people really can't afford. The only way, but, but if we bring in, you know, again, more industry, more investment, that'll build up our property tax revenue, give us millions more in the general fund and uh, be able to afford more nice things. That's it. Thank you. Thank you, Brandon. Richard, um, your answer to our question. Okay, uh, so I think that, uh, well, the first thing is kind of combined is uh, housing and homelessness. Uh, and I think the second, uh, you know, another thing is uh, the infrastructure for our city. I know that we're running to a place where our infrastructure is increasingly older um, some of our water pipes are 67 years old and they will break. Uh, and in the face of a possible earthquake, climate change, different uh, flooding issues that we might face, uh, we need to start addressing that and planning for the future. Um, so as far as housing and houselessness goes in our community, I think that we need to be increasing the supply of housing by both addressing housing density in appropriate areas, as well as uh, the diversity of housing. Not everybody needs a four or five bedroom house. Uh, if we can work with the university to make uh, student housing, the supply on campus, higher. I think that would put a good downward uh, pressure on rents. It might make some rent uh, landlords want to sell their houses, which would also put a downward pressure on home house prices. I know that my wife and I bought our house eight years ago and is theoretically doubled in price, which is unsustainable. There's no other way that we could live in this community right now with the amount of money that we make. Uh, so I think that if we can put downward pressure on housing, if we can provide different options for those that are houseless, and that if we can uh, work to improve that. All right, thank you. Thank you very much, Richard. And Allison. I don't wanna to repeat too much of what's already been said, but I wholeheartedly agree. Affordable housing is should be the top issue that council addresses over over time like brennan said we are the most rent rent burdened city in the entire state over 60 percent of corvallis residents are renters i myself have rented the past eight years in corvallis and i am acutely aware of how unaffordable it rent is currently and how unattainable home ownership is in this current climate uh, council should be addressing, if elected to council, we would be addressing this through a three-pronged strategy, uh, transitional housing availability to address our, our neighbors experiencing homelessness to eventually transition into permanent housing. Like Richard mentioned, I absolutely agree that we should be increasing our housing supply through residential infill, rezoning to allow for more uh, dense residential uh or de dense residential properties. The city council has done an awesome job of updating our downtown zoning laws to uh, improve mixed use livability. And I think we need to continue those efforts and push further to allow uh, or AD to expand um, the current policies surrounding ADUs, the, um, as well as uh, increasing the availability of um, larger, larger apartment structures to increase the supply of housing diversity, because everyone has different housing needs from a small a family that's starting up to students here for education, all the way to people who are facing retirement. I want to 
let live the, their, their golden years in Corvallis. Everyone has different housing needs and that, that should be the most important part is increasing housing diversity and making sure that everyone has a safe, stable home to uh, live in Corvallis with. I also think uh, we need to address uh, community resilience and combating uh, and, and lo looking at- Please wrap up at, if you can. Okay, sorry about that, yeah. Okay, well, thank you, Allison. I'm sorry to break in there. Um, so uh, Anne and I are going to switch roles now. I'm going to be the uh, timekeeper. And Anne, what's our next question? So how will you work to ensure the meaningful engagement and input from the public is represented in your deliberations and decisions as a city councilor? And we'll start with Richard and then go to Allison and Brennan. Okay, uh, so I think city government works best when the elected officials listen to the constituents that they represent. Um, I understand that as a city councilor, I don't just or wouldn't just uh, represent uh, Ward 6. I would represent the entire city of Corvallis. And I think that, uh, you know, given what I'm currently doing as a stay-at-home parent, uh, it does... Uh, take a lot of time, but it is also flexible. Uh, so I think that I would be able to be reactive to community calls, emails, and uh, I think it would be beneficial to, uh, you know, if elected, I would like to set up uh, probably a weekly meeting with, uh, you know, really anybody uh, in the city that wanted to speak their mind. And you're muted. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and now we'll uh, go to Allison. So I'm committed to engaging with underrepresented voices, including renters, youth, seniors, and marginalized communities to ensure their input is a part of the decision making process. As a person with white skin, I recognize my privilege in society. Um, and I also understand uh, the understand the intersectionality between having a, a queer and trans identity, as well as a person living with disabilities. I understand in some respects what, what it's like to not have your, your personhood represented fully in a larger community forum. Uh, I highly value interactive community engagement and beyond newsletters or email updates, I want that face-to-face -face connection with people and be able, being able to connect with community engagement groups as well as uh, public forums to be, a rep to be representative and approachable because these issues that matter the most to the community must be reflected in all council deliberations. In all these efforts, I will prioritize active listening to make sure that feedback is not only heard, but truly incorporated into policy discussions. Thank you. Thank you, Allison. And now we move to Brennan. Thank you. Uh, public, public input and transparency is incredibly important to me. Um, and I have a few steps that I plan to take on it. Uh, I'm, I plan to run weekly public meetings as a counselor. I'm already doing this during the campaign. You can come find me at 2 p.m. every Sunday at Porter Park. Uh, I give out my personal phone number and email all the time, and I have a calendar booking link that anyone can go grab coffee uh, with me any morning if they'd like. Um, I also think it's important to gauge public opinion and actual public opinion, not just the public that shows up to the city council meetings. So I pledge every month as I go forward as a counselor, I'll be knocking 100 doors a month every single month. I will also not be taking disproportionate input from donors. I think this is an important thing. Uh, there are some pretty strong special interests in our city. I don't take any campaign donations. I never have, I, don't, I never plan to, um, in order to be able to make the decisions that I think are best and most according to the, uh, or most according with the, the general interest of our community. You know, like Allison, I'm happy to uh, answer or to talk to anyone. And I think a lot of that is, uh, it's about being proactive because most people just don't really engage in local politics if that's not the default. Uh, so I plan to be out there as much as I can uh, and really just hear not only everyone who wants to talk to me, uh, but also people who wouldn't think to go out and, you know, give their city councilor a phone call. Thank you, Brennan. And now, Greg, I'll have a question. 
All right. Um, our next question, I think, will allow uh, Candice to extend uh, the, some of the discussions that have already been started here. Um, our question is, the city has a large urban growth boundary. What are your plans to service this land for the future, including infrastructure like sewer, water, and transportation? Do you support a new memorandum of understanding with the county in relation to uh, use and development within the urban growth boundary? We'll start with Allison, Brennan will follow, and we'll end with Richard. So Allison, please. So expanding outward leads to urban sprawl, which places unnecessary strain on infrastructure, our sewer, water, transportation, without generating enough economic return to sustain it. Instead, we should prioritize densification and smart growth within existing areas to ensure that the city can accommodate more residents and businesses without overextending our resources. In line with the Strong Towns model, we should prioritize projects that enhance our existing infrastructure and maximize economic productivity per acre. This approach not only ensures long-term sustainability, but also strengthens our economic base to support critical infrastructure like sewer, water, and transportation. And by building compact, walkable neighborhoods, we reduce the need for costly new infrastructure while creating vibrant, economically resilient communities. By focusing on smart growth, growth and strategic partnerships, we can ensure the future expansion within the urban growth boundary benefits both Corvallis and Benton County, maintaining a high quality of life for all residents. Well, thank you, Allison. Uh, Brennan, you're next. Thank you. Uh, we need to annex aggressively. Um, we didn't annex up north when we could have, and the result is that there's a whole ton of like landed estates up north of the city where there would be suburbs, because a Benton County for uh, home development has a five acre lot minimum. So there are just lots of like, you know, giant suburban palaces out there with five acre lots. That's what happens when we don't annex. I love infill. I love in, I live in the center of Corvallis because I love the density. I don't use a car normally. I don't have to. Uh, but infill isn't enough. We don't have enough land for infill. It's not going to keep up. We also need to annex and we also need to grow. We don't need to sprawl a ton, but like we have to do some of it. Um, we also should try look at proactively building infrastructure in order to spur development. Uh, there are some nuances in sort of the tax code, um, but basically if we proactively uh, uh, eminent domain and build infrastructure into some empty lots, that can prompt people to build because they have to pay for the infrastructure to their uh, to their lot, even before, or as opposed to just the property tax. And so a lot of investors who are just sitting on the land, uh, they'll start cash flowing negative and actually develop it. That's one tool in the city's arsenal that I think we should look at using more aggressively. Uh, we should also look at doing something that Albany has done, um, which is that they have a, a pot of like, you know, a, about a million or $2 uh, that the city has um, agency over in using to like proactively improve infrastructure. And this can help when a big project is coming in that it's not clear like what would need to be done infrastructure wise. Uh, instead of going through a two or three year review process to figure it out, the city can just build the infrastructure for them. You know, it might cost, you know, $200,000, $300,000, but the alternative is that the project doesn't leave. And also on this size of project, we're usually getting a few million dollars in property tax anyway, after they've built. So it's a good proactive investment that we should look at sort of making a fund to be able to do. Uh, and as to the memo of understanding with Benton County, I would have to look at what that would get replaced with. You know, I'm always in favor of something more beneficial for the city, um, but, you know, I can't commit to abandoning it without looking at uh, what the alternative might end up being. Thank you, Brennan. And uh, Richard. Okay, um, you know, I really think that we need to attack this on all ends. I think, uh, there is some good options for uh, annexation and moving outward, but I also agree that density is important. I think density and diversity is where we need to focus. Um, there's lots of room where we can increase density and not overtax our infrastructure, as well as uh, providing a diversity of different types of housing. Um, Apartments are not for everybody. Single family homes are not for everybody. Uh, we need to address as many of those different uh, housing needs that we can. Uh, otherwise, uh, also included um, in that expansion is 
making sure that we have public transportation for everybody and making sure that our, uh, you know, the free bus is something that's amazing about Corvallis, whether you're somebody with disabilities that can, uh, has mobility issues, or you're somebody that is low income and does can't afford a car, or you're just somebody that, hey, you got stuck downtown and you're on your bike and you don't want to ride home in the rain and you can take the bus home. It's great to have that. Uh, I think that we need to expand our public transportation as best as possible and uh, look at in the strategic planning moving towards a greener version of that with either electric or hydrogen powered buses uh, would be phenomenal. Thanks uh, all of you for uh, answering that question. And uh, Anne, what's next? Quick question. Yeah. Did, um... Um, I would like to ask, are there specific actions you would take if elected to advance racial equity in our community? And we'll start with Brennan and then go to Richard and then Allison. Quick question. Uh, did you guys hear the last of my um, thing? The hotspot I was on died. Did you get my full statement for the last question? We're, we're... Okay, cool. Yes. Um, for racial equity, um, I think the most important thing here is transparency. Uh, privilege propagates or and, and differential treatment propagates through uh, mostly private actions. You know, I've talked to some, uh, I talked to this guy named Tracy over living in the apartments um, over by Highland. Um, and he talks about like a lot of the stuff that the uh, done to him and his name. Uh, cams. I'm in favor of really any kind of uh, tracking uh, that is possible because the more transparency we get, the, oh, I think my connection is shaky. Oh, no. Okay. You guys are moving again. Uh, the more transparency we get, the, the less the room there is for funny business. Um, so that's sort of on the on the police side there. Uh, other than that, I mean, the way you help the ones at the bottom is that you help raise them up economically. And that just goes back to my same two points. We need better jobs for people even without excellent educations. Um, and we need uh, rent prices to be lower and so that people can, you know, both afford to live, afford something nice, and then also, you know, be able to get on the home ownership ladder someday. Um, and, you know, refer to my other questions as to how we do that. Um, but, you know, Raising the bottom up is a matter of fixing the big problems that are hammering the bottom. And here that is uh, housing prices and sort of a lack of good jobs around here. Thank you, Brennan. And now we'll hear from Richard. Yeah, so um, there's only so much that I feel like we can do at the specific city council level uh, for this. I think as a city, we do a good job of uh, you know, making sure that the hiring process at city level positions are viewed in an equitable sort of way. Um, I appreciate the fact that our uh, city law enforcement is part of the CLIA program and has a plus uh, rating with that. Um, I think that's something that uh, needs to be encouraged to uh, continue. And um, otherwise, uh, I wouldn't be opposed to uh, possibly viewing something like uh, special workers for law enforcement uh, non-emergencies, where maybe somebody's having a mental health crisis and we're not necessarily sending the police where their time could be better spent elsewhere, um, and something in the model of uh, Cahoots down in Eugene or something similar uh, might be useful for our city, uh, something to consider. Thank you, um, Richard. And now we'll have Allison. While the city's diversity training for employees is a positive step, there's limited visibility on how the broader community is being educated on issues of racial equity, privilege, and systemic racism. Without widespread cultural competency, efforts may fall short. Improvements we can make include partnering with local schools, university, and community groups to create public education campaigns around racial equity and the history of discrimination in public services. 
Regular events, cultural celebrations, and workshops on equity issues could be organized to foster community-wide understanding and commitments to inclusivity. To improve racial equity in Corvallis, we should focus on more data-driven accountability, broader community engagement, and policies that actually tackle systemic issues in policing, housing, and economic disparities. By expanding beyond advisory roles and incorporating, uh, and incorporating equity into all aspects, aspects of city governance, Corvallis can create a more inclusive and just community. Thank you, Allison. And now, Greg. Uh, thank you. Yeah. Um, uh, here's a question that has been on my mind for quite a while. Um, council events have called attention to the relationship between the council and the city manager and staff leadership. Is the relationship between our city council and the city staff and management in need of change? We're going to begin with uh, Richard's answer, then move to Allison, and we will end with Brennan. So, uh, Richard. Uh, I, I'm guessing that this is in relation to sh the Charlene Ellis lawsuit uh, currently pending. Well, I I think I have to leave it as it's phrased. Um, I understood. But... Anyway, um, so moving on, I don't think that there's a particularly, I don't think the system needs to change. Um, this may be simply an issue of misunderstanding, uh, meeting misinterpretation, and uh, I'd certainly be open. I'm not an expert on this uh, topic. I have a uh, reasonable understanding based on what's been reported, but I think that uh, we don't at this time need to change the city charter or our basic fundamental form of government um, in order to work more effectively as a uh, city government. Uh, but, you know, I certainly think that I am open to all solutions if, uh, you know, I'm not going to turn down a good idea uh, based on any of my preconceptions. Well, thank you. And uh, Allison, uh, you're next. So I think this is an interesting question. Um, and it really comes into play, I think, in the ongoing discussion or the recent and ongoing discussions that have been surrounding the uh, strategic operating plan, or rather the separation of the current strategic operating plan into a strategic and a separate operating plan. Um, because of how this these ideas have been combined in the past. I honestly think that some of the dis ongoing discussions that council has been having and will continue to have really highlight some of the incongruencies in how uh, policy is decided on and enacted. The role of council is to provide a strategic uh, framework in which uh, and specific policies in which the uh, city operates. The role of a city manager is to, uh, within that framework and policy established by council, to work on these specific tactics to operate and actually uh, produce the the goals of that policy and the strategic plan. So I, I think there needs to be a recentering in that that strategic versus tactical framework work and really understand the role of council is to buy, provide both large general direction and a spe and specific frameworks in which the city manager and ultimately city staff make the best decisions to implement the goals of council. Thank you, Allison. And uh, Brennan. Thank you. Uh, regarding the Ellis lawsuit, I think this is mostly moot. She's going to be reelected without opposition this fall. Um, regarding the strategic... Or, uh, does the uh, relationship need to change? I mean, whether it does or not, it's changing. You know, we're reviewing the strategic operating plan, and that might even be done before whichever one of us the voters choose takes office. Uh, so I think it'll be a totally different landscape in January. Uh, but in general, I, I, I wanted to talk about how uh, in the city manager form of government, the city council is supposed to lead, and the city manager is supposed to um, implement the goals and recommendations of the city council. Four sitting city councilors in private conversation have said to me some form of the phrase, 
the city council has abdicated. There is no leadership. And, and, the, and the problem is that when there's a structure around one body leading and another you know, system following their lead, if the, that body isn't leading, then the system falls down. So, so I, I think there's a lot of anger at the city manager for um, you know, various things, but my understanding of the situation is, is mostly that the city manager is doing what he can to try to guide the city because the people who should be guiding the city along, i.e. the city council, the body, uh, have not really effectively. And, and so that's one thing that I would uh, try to help change uh, you know, on the council. Brandon, uh, thank you. I, to... Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, sorry? You're, uh, your screen had frozen. Please go ahead. Okay, what was the word? Um, what was the last thing you guys heard? I, I'd be hard pressed to tell you exactly. No problem. Um, you want to take a few, just a few seconds then to wrap up. I mean, sound is good now again. Sure. Uh, the last thing I was saying was I've heard there heard talk about firing or declining to renew the city count manager's contract. You know, I'd be happy to look at all options, but I think ultimately it's probably a systems problem, not a personnel problem right here. Thank you, Brennan. I'm sorry about the technical uh, problems that ensued. And thanks to all of you uh, for your response on that question. And uh, you have another question for the candidates. I do. Um, the city is in the process of planning and uh, designs for a new civic campus on Madison Avenue. What are your thoughts on the civic campus to replace the existing city hall? And would you support its development? And we'll start with Allison and then move to Brennan and then finally to Richard. So the current city hall was not designed for inclusive access. It lacks the appropriate infrastructure to host collaborative office spaces and related technical equipment. And it costs the city hundreds of thousands of dollars in ongoing repairs each year. The more I've learned about city, the city hall and the ongoing and the infrastructure issues within our municipal offices, the more I've shifted my perspective because on the outside, we have a gorgeous city hall, but when you kind of peel back those initial layers, you learn how dysfunctional of a, a physical body the, the buildings and the internal offices are. And if your city staff can't collaborate and can't function, uh, function in their job duties, you're not going to have effective management of local government. Uh, the current city hall was originally a church, it was a dormitory, and nothing is more permanent than a temporary solution. So I think having a strategic plan to create a civic campus that incorporates universal design, it's emphasizing inclusivity, it's thinking about those collaborative spaces, having uh, opportunities for like public performances, for just making a beautiful walkable open space. I'm all for it as part of like a larger downtown revitalization project. I think that there are some good points brought up about splitting up certain projects within the city campus redesign. But overall, I'm in support of uh, improving our internal infrastructure to better city operations. Thank you, Allison. And now Brennan. Uh, looks amazing. Very expensive. Uh, we probably can't afford it right now. Uh, we're talking like a, a, a significant chunk of a billion dollars uh, that would we'd have to you know raise taxes to be able to fund that. Uh, it's very nice. It looks like you know I want nice things, um, but. Like we have to look at like the city barely has money to replace a pipe infrastructure. Um, and when we're looking at this amount of, of cost, we really, really have to justify it. Allison's point, Allison did a great overview of like the, the arguments for it. Uh, I agree with all those. I would also add, you know, given that this is hosted by the NWACP, that it not only used to be a church, it used to be the Southern Methodist Church, uh, which was the pro-slavery church in town back in the day after the Civil War. Um, so there's a history of racial sort of, you know, problems, even in the building itself. I really like the proposal. I would love to have it. I think we really do need to have a serious conversation about how it would be funded, though. Uh, there are two parts to the current proposal. There's the Civic Campus, and then there's the Police Center. Um, I would be in favor of, I think, splitting these up. I think the Police Center is more urgent. 
uh, the line I've heard is that the evidence room floods uh, in our current uh, one. Uh, that's probably not great. Uh, so um, yeah, uh, it would be good. It would save us money. It would save us staff retention. Uh, it would be a great community space. I love it. I'm still not sure if we can afford it or if it would be prudent to do that uh, with our current revenues and budget right now. Thank you, Brennan. And now Greg has a question. Uh, I, 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 we need it to Richard, did we? Yes. You, you did I'm not. sorry, okay. Richard. I'm <laughs> sorry. <laughs> it's Richard's turn. Uh, so um, I don't think this is the top priority. Uh, I do like the idea of splitting it up uh, between police and uh, the civic services. I think both need to be done. They both will be done eventually. Um, we certainly can't have an evidence room that floods. If if evidence gets ruined, cases are ruined, justice is denied to victims, that's certainly unacceptable. I think that it is uh, totally, it's in the long run, it's more effective to have the civic campus set up uh, where we can spend you know we're being penny smart dollar uh not smart <laughs> uh if we continue to put off the improvements on the city hall because we are as allison said we are spending uh we're spending hundreds of thousands of dollars on upkeep and maintenance on something that is outdated and inadequate <clears throat> so an initial investment will pay dividends later on down the road. Um, where I would prioritize that, I'd have to see the proposals. I do think that there are also maybe opportunities to uh, potentially lower the cost, maybe lower some of the ambition and de use some of these cities existing infrastructure and facilities to have some of the proposed uh, offices or plans. Thank you, Richard. And now Greg can ask a question. All right, thank you, Anne. Uh, my question is, are reported incidents of racial bias and hate crimes adequately documented and addressed in our city, would you alter or augment the process in place? We're going to begin with Brennan. Uh, Richard will follow, we'll end with Allison. So uh, Brennan, your response. Right. This is gonna sound totally fake, but literally two hours ago, I was over by the Division Street Apartments over by Highland, uh, knocking doors. And I came across a man named Tracy. He's an older black man, 55, 60-ish. Uh, and he had just had a rock thrown through the window of his van by one of his neighbors, uh, which he said was, you know, another incident in a in a continuing a continual rain or a continual like pattern of of incidents of sort of racial hate because of who he is in that area. Um he uh I didn't even approach it or I, I was walking along. I was knocking a different part of doors and he was, I heard him ranting about how we need more security cameras around here. You know, I think more um, transparency, more accountability is always good here, but also it's important to learn as I listened to this guy's stories for over half an hour, that a, some of this is coming from the police department. Uh, at least as he told the story one time, he said about eight years ago, um, you know, a, a, police officer followed him into a parking lot, you know, put put the hand on his gun and was just sort of asking him questions and only left when he called somebody else, you know, complaining that he might have been about to be shot. Um, he's obviously never reported any of this to the police because he believes this to be part of the problem. Um, I, I, I don't know what we can do about this. I asked him, I don't know. Uh, I think we should certainly at least be aware of any, you know, possible incidents of, of bias and re realize that we are actually, you know, as sad as it is, uh, doing a decent job, you know, uh, Richard talked about our police uh, department's accreditation. We're one of only three uh, departments in the state that have that. I think there's always room for improvement. I'm not sure what specifically we can do, except be aware that, you know, the racial biases and problems propagate and they propagate even here, um, even in Oregon. Um, so 
uh, yeah, not too, not too much to say about like solutions to that issue other than being aware of it. And like, again, having as much data, as much transparency into any interaction between especially our police force and the public as possible. Thank you, Brennan. Uh, Richard, you're next. Your response. Yeah, so I do I do think that our law enforcement uh, accreditation is a good first step. Um, but as Brennan kind of pointed out, uh, you know, if things are reported, they don't count. They don't uh, they don't come into the conversation uh, in an official sort of manner. And, you know, Oregon as a state does not have the as much as we're viewed as a progressive, you know, forward thinking state, there is a tremendous uh, legacy of racism and hate that does exist here and still exists, unfortunately, because uh, you know, that sort of thing is taught and pushed on other people. Um, as far as what we can do it about it at the city council level, I think uh, it would be maybe be nice to engage our minority community for uh, maybe a police oversight position where we have civilians that are involved. Uh, I know part of the CLIA is an outside person uh, attached to that accreditation agency who reviews documents, but I also think that maybe having a civilian arm uh, attached to the police department that hears complaints about racial bias or uh you know perceived biases bias crimes um and having a non-law enforcement person that can be reported to that might make pe people feel more comfortable thank you richard and elson so if you go to the city website and use their nifty little search for report bias, the link it takes you to literally does not work. And I feel like that says kind of a lot about this question and the the lack of um, reporting mechanisms that our city has built in. In 2020 or 2021, over $150,000 was approved for the budget dedicated to uh, community input for developing a racial bias reporting or bias incident reporting. It's 2024 that the work and effort that those committees and work sessions put time and money into has not resulted in a reporting system. The city currently relies on state reporting mechanisms and, re uh, and redirects in other places straight to the Oregon DOJ site. Um, the count at the county level, there's actually been slightly more commitment and involvement recently into creating um, a bias reporting mechanism that supports the entirety of Benton County, not just as a local municipal or local municipality. And I am absolutely in favor of one of the main recommendations: hiring a full-time uh, support liaison for the track county hotline so that there's a human being who lives in our county that you can call and will help in uh, direct and investigate resources not necessarily someone at the state level who might be more overworked with the entirety of bias incidents around the state so that's one of the main things i would recommend and i'm also in favor for pushing making those policies other policy recommendations by the regional bias reporting um or regional bias committee, um, their findings and making sure that they are a priority for uh, council to recommend as uh, to the larger county county support systems. Thank you, Allison. Uh, that's the last question uh, that we're going to answer uh, or that we're going to pose uh, in tonight's uh, forum. Uh, and I think it's time for final comments. Well, thank you, candidates for Ward 6. We'll now turn to your final statements. And please tell the voters listening in one and a half minutes why they should vote for you. 
And oh, I don't have. Oh, we start with Richard, then go to Allison, and then Brennan. All right. Uh, you know, honestly, I think we're all three very uh, qualified candidates with similar goals. Um, you know, really, the only thing I have to offer beyond Brennan and Allison are slightly different ideas on maybe how to reach those goals and maybe a little bit more time, uh, <laughs> depending. Uh, and I think we all want to see Corvallis become a vibrant community that's accepting for everybody, where everybody can live in an affordable sort of way without being priced out, forced into homelessness. Um, you know, uh, that's welcoming to everybody. And uh, if you vote for me, I will work my hardest to listen to the voters and do my best to make policy that is in the best interest of all of our neighbors. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. And now we'll go to Allison. Thank you again for the opportunity to speak tonight. Corvallis is a city built on community and I'm running for city council because I believe in the power of community driven solutions, whether it's affordable housing, climate action, or creating safer, more connected neighborhoods. I'm ready to advocate for policies that put people first. With my experience in labor organizing, negotiations, and policymaking, I am committed to bringing a thoughtful, inclusive, and solutions-oriented approach to the council. I look forward to working with each of you to make Corvallis a better place for everyone. Thank you, Allison. And now, Brennan. Um, yeah, I think as Rich said, we're all more or less on the same page. So maybe we, we need a little more diversity in running for council. Um, I think either of them would do a good job. However, I think I'm in the best position of the three of us to be able to execute on our shared priorities. You know, I have a career, it's a well-paying career in solving systems problems in codified systems. That's exactly what we have here. We have a system with rules that is provided, producing the results that we don't want to see. And we need someone who's able to fix that. I also have the most experience with our local government. As, as far as I'm aware, both Rich and Allison really got involved in the, in the last few months running up to this election. I've been around here for quite some time and have been following for a long time uh, what's happening on the local city level uh, or, or the, sorry, local, uh, you know, political level. I have relationships with people who are already, you know, on council, ready to hit the ground running. Um, and I think that, um, you know, similarly to Rich, I'll have a lot of time uh, to be able to uh, put in all the effort I can. Um, I think any three of us would be a fine counselor, uh, but I would ask you to vote for me for those reasons. Thank you, Brennan. And now Greg will uh, do our final wrap up. Yes, well, thank you so very much. Ward 6 candidates, Allison Bowden, Brennan Kohlberg, and Richard Masella uh, for joining us in this uh, lively discussion and for sharing um, your interest in taking a seat uh, on Corvallis City Council. Thank you for participating in democracy. To all those who are watching, on behalf of the Lynn Benton branch of the NAACP and the League of Women Voters of Corvallis, thank you for listening in. Thank you for being an informed voter. Uh, please remember to talk to your friends, your neighbors, and families about voting in this general election, and good evening. Sorry, I'm looking for my stop record.